Hi, Brett here, and today we'll be taking another look at Hunter Gatherer. This time, an example of gameplay. I'm going to play this mission solo, and I'm only going to take two characters. That'll make it a little bit more difficult. Let's see how it unfolds. The second level one mission is called the Hunting Party. In this, I need to find the objective room and clear all of the enemies. If I can do that, each of the characters that survives will get 1d3 gear rolls. I'm playing using the survivalist and the hunter, and here they've emerged from their survival shelter. The number 6 token will be placed behind them, and the number 5 token placed in front. I've just generated a standard room. So this will be pushed out in the direction of the number 5 token. That number 5 token is replaced, and is the new furthest exit point. When a new room is placed, I roll 1d6. On a roll to 1 to 4, the corresponding enemies are placed. In this case, I roll a 4, and then 2d6, and generate a total of 6 zombies. They're placed in the room at the furthest exit, and then in a pattern that moves slowly towards the player that opened the exit in the first place. The zombies are deployed, and so now I start a new turn by rolling my activation dice. Each player rolls a 1, so I generate a random event. On this occasion, some more zombies are deployed, but they will be at location number 4, which hasn't appeared on the map yet. So I place the zombies, in this case 2d3, a total of 4 zombies, on the number 4 token to the side. This will appear if I find a T-junction, or definitely if I make it to the objective room. What you're watching is the play sped up in a particular combat, moving through all of these phases. Each of my characters only starts off with 5 wounds, and while the survivalist does have healing, if I happen to roll a number 6 activation dice, it's best to play it safe, stay side by side, and try and bottleneck the enemy as much as possible. Their basic attacks are with a 3 plus activation dice, they both have some form of a knife, but with those they're only rolling a d12. The zombies, in this case, are rolling d20s. Both of the characters have a defense rating of 11, so those d20s need to score 10 or less to cause a wound. With only 5 starting wounds, they're pretty vulnerable to being wiped out early. Six zombies is a fairly minor skirmish, and in this case they've been able to escape mostly unscathed with just one wound each. At the next exit, they reveal an ambush point. This plays a little differently. The number five token is moved up once again, but in addition to that, a number one token is placed at a point that would look like zombies could come out of it. In this case, I have a large pipe culvert, and I imagine that the creatures are crawling out. From each of the tokens in this space I roll to generate enemy. In one instance at the number 5 point there are some zombie dogs and at the number 1 I first roll no enemies a 5 but an ambush point always has to have enemies so I roll again and then generate some plague rats. Just after that I really tempt fate by rolling at least one each in the activation phase. This generates an event. In this case, one of my players has become infected. The survivalist has a green token placed over their wound count, and now they have one less wound in total. They only have to take four to go down now. It can be healed in the right circumstances, but for now they're carrying this infection until the end of the mission. Remember, this is a miniature agnostic game. All of the zombies and characters come from Zombicide, but the dogs come from Folklore the Affliction, and the rats are from one of my favourite dungeon crawlers, Warhammer Quest. If you found yourself in a situation where you needed to deploy one of these enemies and you didn't have a good proxy miniature, you could always just use some kind of a token. In Hunter Gatherer, the zombies do not climb. So I'm able to use this bit of terrain as a really handy bottleneck to reduce the number of wounds that I'm suffering and the number of enemies that are coming through at once. Another activation roll where each character rolls a 1, I consult the table and this time 
the survivalist also gains a mental condition. This one reduces their activation dice by one. So I place a token over one of those dice spots, just to remind me, and I take one of the dice off straight away. It's time to use one of the main strategies of the game. The hunter moves up on top of the pipe and gains a height advantage. While he's up there, the armor of the enemy is plus one. In this case, the zombie dogs go from a seven to an eight, and I'm slightly more likely to hit them. While I'm higher than them, my armor becomes a 10 instead of 11, and I'm less likely to be hit. In Hunter Gatherer, you must roll underneath the defense to damage the target. A one is a critical hit, and unless a zombie is super tough, it doesn't matter how many wounds it has, it automatically kills them. The game is designed this way so that no matter which dice you are using, a one is always a critical hit. The more powerful weapons, such as grenades, roll much lower dice, for example some D4s. D4 attacks are guaranteed to take out weaker enemies. They'll do a lot of damage on stronger enemies too, but some of those stronger enemies have multiple wounds. The other factor that you have to take into account is that attacks that have a lower dice also require a higher activation cost, so you're less likely to be able to use it most of the time. For example, the hunter has a hunting rifle. This is only activated on an activation dice roll of a 6. But if you do get to use it, it has a much bigger range and you only roll a d8 instead of his knife, which is a d12. When you're attacking an enemy that's not adjacent to you, you don't need line of sight through other models, but you do need line of sight through terrain including corners and high pieces of terrain. The next room I generate is a cache room. This will have a gear token, so I have a 100% chance of picking up some kind of gear. Because I'm adding another room, you'll notice that I've taken off the first room, the starting one. This rule means that you don't need quite as much table space. It also means that the number 6 token has moved up, and even if slow moving zombies are put into play, they still have a chance of catching up to you. There will be times in the game that more than 3 tiles will be in play, especially if you find a T-junction. But here you can see 3 tokens are still in effect. The number 1 ambush point is still in that rear tile, so if I rolled a 1, 6 or a 5 when enemy are randomly deployed, they have a chance of coming straight onto the board and surrounding me. Here I'm moving into this room to try and clear out just a few plague rats. There's also that gear token sitting in that area in the middle of the tile. The character moves up and I have a look. I find a trauma kit which is particularly handy if the other character goes to zero wounds and becomes prone. I can get them back up again. I'm not using a character sheet for this mission, so I just use a whiteboard marker and make a note on the back of the sheet there. I didn't want the mission to take too long. I wanted to get as much of the video in as possible, so I started to take risks a little. With one plague rat still in play, I decided to open up the next area. It just turned out that the next area happened to be the objective room. So, I was about to get a whole lot of pressure. The objective room is an abandoned military checkpoint. I made this in an earlier episode of Nuggets Dungeon Terrain. You can go back there and see how it was put together. In placing the objective room, I removed the third most tile section behind the characters. I then place all of the tokens, except for the number 6, which is behind me, in the objective room. This includes the ambush point number 1, which I place at this small pipe coming out of the mud just near the busted up tank. One of those tokens is area 4, so 
four zombies that have been waiting this whole time are about to come into play as well. You can see at the top of the page under objective room it says I'm going to deploy two bloaters and 12 zombies. They're going to come from two different locations so I simply roll a d6. If I roll a 6 I'll need to re-roll because that 6 is still behind me and represents random zombies following the action up the street. In this case I roll one deployment area which is unfortunately quite close to where I'm trying to come in so they've just bottlenecked me. The two bloaters are much further away. I might have a chance with my hunting rifle to pick them up before they make it even closer and use their rage vomiting damage. Survivalist picks up the last plague rat and moves into the entrance to help block it. The hunter is going to use his six to try and take out one of the bloaters before they get closer. They do have multiple wounds, but they don't have the tough skill. So if I can roll a 1 on that D8, I can take out one of those. The only disadvantage of critical hits is that you only get one experience point. You gain an experience point for every wound you inflict. And a critical hit might take out a 5 point creature, but it's still one hit. The objective room is always going to play out as an epic battle. Let's just watch the play unfold for a while. On this activation phase, another event is generated. This time at Area 6, three zombie dogs are going to try and attack me from behind. You may have noticed that when I have a large number of zombies, I take some of the back ones and just move them into the spaces that have been made by a couple that were killed at the front. This is so I don't have to move all of them, just a small amount. There, the zombie dogs are defeated and I can once again turn my attention to the zombies at the front. Here's another shot with a hunting rifle and blam, a one, a critical hit and I've just taken out one of the bloaters just before it got into range and vomit all over me. You'll notice a lot of wound tokens on the character cards at the bottom there. That's why I've stepped the survivalist back. I'm hoping that the hunter can absorb some of the hits while the survivalist tries to roll some sixes and do some first aid. It's at this point in the mission that I make a critical mistake. Two players is probably a little bit harder than three or four. And it's not a good idea to separate them. I had a feeling that my survivalist might be able to pick off a couple of zombies but it didn't go to plan and I had some really bad attack rolls and suddenly the zombies attack and the survivalist finds themselves prone. That's fine though, I have that trauma kit and I can bring them back but I first need to be able to get through with the hunter and pick them up. The hunter's surrounded by zombies and blam, just like that. They're both taken out of the game. Thank you for making it this far into the video and thanks for your interest in playing Hunter Gatherer. There are some rules that I didn't touch on in any depth, especially the exploration of skills and skill tests. These can be taken to the next level, by the way, by adding some role-playing elements, maybe having a game master. If my characters had survived, I can choose to turn the game into a campaign. I return to my survival shelter, and there's a whole 
between missions section. This includes your character's level progression. Thanks again for tuning in and if you're here watching this video as part of the Kickstarter campaign, it'd be great to see you get on board.